So welcome to technical session T42, where we're going to be talking about some security prevention methods that you can use to kind of create those layers of security uh, for your systems and your business, or even your home, depending on how you want to set it up. Although I don't know many people who would put a man trap in their house, but you know, I wouldn't put it past some people. Um, first, our objectives are going to be to identify a variety of security prevention methods. Uh, we're going to compare and contrast common methods uh, to aid in physical and digital security. So we're kind of distinguishing between those two and explain several ways that clients can prevent security threats on their own. And then also talk a little bit about the principle of least privilege. Behavior skills and mindsets we want to kind of keep in place for this particular technical session is teamwork and future orientation. IT is a team sport. It's not an individual thing, especially when it comes to security. This is the entire group needs to pay attention. It's not just the IT group, but the organization. Um, if this is lax throughout the organization, if proper training is not in place, then, you know, this whatever security methods you have in place are not going to be as functional because some of the easiest ways to bypass the most robust security is social engineering attacks. Uh, we also wanna maintain future orientation. The things we do today will affect our outcomes in the future. Um, so if we set up good systems today, set up good education today, that is, or good, you know, end user education that's gonna set up us for a much higher probability of success in rebuffing a security threat. So we're gonna be talking about a few different types of prevention methods. Um, and many of us, when we think of IT security, we're almost always thinking about the software and hardware aspect of it, our computer systems, how robust our processors are, what kind of firewalls we're using and stuff like that. And we tend to forget about the physical aspects of security. Um, I briefly mentioned that yesterday, that if a attacker has physical access to your systems, they own your systems. Essentially, if they can physically lay hands on them, they can do whatever they want to them at that point. So we need to put physical security measures in place between your systems and a would-be attacker. We also wanna talk about, in general, digital security. And this is more predominantly focused on keeping digital malware and harmful software out of your systems. Also, because uh, social engineering attacks are such a big threat, we need to focus on user education as well as crafting and continually reminding people of the acceptable use policy, which is essentially a document that lets users know what they can and cannot do on the systems at the organization. And then finally, we'll talk about the, uh, the principle of least privilege, which is you only give users the bare minimum what they need to do their work on a regular basis. If they require special permissions to, to perform a task once every six months, you don't allow them necessarily to have that access all the time. There would be special circumstances where you could grant them elevated access for a short period, and then they can perform that task and then they go back down to normal standards. So principle of least privilege. So physical security examples that we're gonna be discussing, quite a long list here. We got locked doors, man traps, uh, ID badges, biometrics, smart cards, tokens, all kinds of fun stuff, which we're going to kind of get out, go over in a little bit more detail. First, locked doors. It doesn't sound like much, but a locked door prevents a, you know, a large portion of people trying to get past it. Granted, I do understand the old axiom that locked doors just keep honest people honest, but it is yet another barrier. 
This can be with a physical key. This can be with a digital lock system. Um, and it's, again, just another physical barrier between you and or the potential attacker and your actual systems. So, you know, much like our digital systems, we want to create a layered system. So like here, your first barrier could be, you know, a perimeter fence. So you would have a fence around the entire building. That way you have controlled access points. It could be the main driveway and then one other way to get in and out. And then you could either have ID badges or guards at this fenced area to allow people access into the perimeter. And then you would have security on the building, which would be ID badges as well and or keys, RFID tags, what have you, that would get them access into the building. And then you would have a third barrier, which would be the entrance into the computer room itself. And you would use, you know, biometrics or you know, specified key, you know, key fobs or badges or what have you to get in and there would be an alarm system on that door. So even with this locked door policy, you're setting up these layers. We have a perimeter, you have a building, and then you have the computer room in and of itself. So we're setting up multiple layers. We want it to be less attractive and more difficult to actually gain physical access to our systems. Question. All right. Another physical security example is the man trap. Usually the man trap is a set of two doors with a small room between them. And typically the way they're set up is both doors cannot be opened at the same time. So you have to, you're able to open one, you go in, close it, that locks, then you can open up the next door. <clears throat> so, and they usually would have a verification point inside, either through a, a keypad, key fob, there may be a guard in there, what have you, or a guard, you know, viewing you through a camera. Um, and this, for the most part, helps prevent things like tailgating. Has anybody already go through one of these before? Security measures? Yes, at a prison. At a prison? Okay. Yeah. Um, I worked at a bonded warehouse, which is, you know, items that come in from uh, outside the country and have not been cleared by customs. So they're considered what's called in bond. Um, so you have to have certain levels of security at them. And to get into the warehouse that I worked at, we had to go through two series of man traps, one to get into the administration level and then one to get into the actual physical warehouse. So you know, these are very useful as a security tool. Data centers, prisons, office buildings, there, it's a very common security method. And it kind of prevents like somebody being able to hold open both doors and let whoever they want come through. Because you make it so that both doors cannot be opened at the same time. Cable locks. So we talked about this on the laptop. There was that little oval uh, hole on the side of a laptop where you can actually put in a steel cable with a locking mechanism on it. That, that locking mechanism may either be a key or a combination lock, something like that. And there's no way to get that cable lock off or outside that um, hole without physically damaging the laptop. And then, you know, or cutting the cable, but then you still have the cable attached. So it, it is a deterrent. It's not a perfect mechanism. It is a very low level piece of security. It's a little more, you know, conspicuous if somebody's using bolt cutters to cut the cable to get, you know, the computer free, but it's going to stop somebody casually walking by, picking up and walking off of the laptop. Again, it's creating layers. So there is no one security method that's gonna stop. It's the layers of security that you create um, that are gonna build up this overall profile that's gonna make it less attractive for somebody to try to come in and steal something. Other um, physical security. So companies, 
especially, you know, five years ago, less so now, they generate a large amount of paper. And I'm talking a ton. So one of the ways that thieves may try to gain access or important information, stuff like this, they just go dumpster diving. They literally go in, they pull out the, sh the paper and they try to sift through that paper and see if passwords are written down because people will write down a password temporarily. And then when they're done with it, they just throw it away in their trash can. So they look for people who've written down passwords. They look for um, key information that may have to do with research and development, with the you know stocks of the company, something that may you know, good or bad news, anything that they can use to their advantage. So companies will shred, but simple shredding doesn't necessarily do it. Uh, if you're shredding it into long strips, they can quite literally scan those strips and then use algorithms to put the paper back together and reform the documents, which is why they talk about cross shredding. Uh, so a lot of companies will use what are called cross shredders. They'll shred them down to like confetti almost. Uh, it's like little, you know, one or two centimeter cubes company I worked for was extremely paranoid with stuff like this and they had basically it turned the paper into powder I mean it was quite literally just a frag like just powder there was nothing recognizable about it and that's not even the most paranoid type of shredder you can have they have ones that'll turn it into powder and then they'll add a liquid to it and turn it into a mush and then there is zero chance of being able to reform it from there but it depends on the sensitivity of the data that you have access to and the level of security that the executives want as to what kind of shredders you have. Most companies will have the simple uh, cross-cut shredders or they will hire out an outside service to come in and do bulk shredding for the company. They'll show up, with, it looks like a giant garbage truck, but it has this huge industrial shredder in it. I mean, you could throw phone books in this thing and it'll turn it into it's like powder. So that, you know, these companies will come by once a week, once a month, what have you, and uh, shred up all your documents for you. And then they'll give you a certificate of destruction. Another method, ID badges. This kind of lets you know, is that person allowed to be in the area that they're in? And some organizations have different layers of security. So like different levels of access so operations may be only allowed on like floors one and two, executives on floor 10 and 12, uh, sales staff on floor three. And so they may have like different color badges so that you can see from a distance if that person is supposed to be on that floor. Also elevators, the elevators may not work without the badge telling, you know, and then they'll only have access to the floors they're allowed to have access to. They would have to have special authorization to go to any other floor. This helps compartmentalize, minimize theft, and you know, improves the security of the company. So you can use ID badges for things like that. Other thing, key fobs. Uh, these are, you know, I had one of these at the first company I worked at. It was just basically like a little round uh, keychain that hung on your key ring or whatever. And you could use that to gain access to all the areas that you're allowed to be in. So you could have, you know, it could get you into the main door and then into your, your office area but it wouldn't allow you in any other area. Some of them may work just for the gate, <clears throat> but it allows you to buy, you know, to get past some physical control systems like locked gates, locked doors, things like that. Questions so far? Anybody use key fobs before like this? Has anybody ever worked yes, at a place? for an apartment. <laughs> for an apartment, okay, there you go. Yeah, yes. for my job before. For your job? Uh, did anybody ever have to use the punch cards, the security punch cards? It's like a hard plastic card with holes punched in it. And you have to slide it into a thing and then uh, it would grant you access if it had the right combination in there. That was like an early version of like a key fob or something like that. They had these little like punch cards. It was crazy. All right. Biometrics. So biometrics falls under the something you are category and it can be extremely non-intrusive all the way up to very intrusive depending on the type of biometrics you're using. 
Um, usually a thumbprint or something like that's pretty minimal. An iris scan is usually not bad because I'm scanning the outer part of your eye. You can use a camera to do that. Um, that's almost as good as a fingerprint. Um, hospitals love using the vein patterns in your palm to ID your uh, medical records and stuff like that. There's a couple of hospitals here in Jacksonville that do that. And it can get as intrusive as DNA. You know, they're taking blood to verify you are who you say you are. Uh, facial recognition. Um, a lot of these things have come a long way. Early instances of like fingerprint or facial recognition, they were only using like three or four points of reference to determine you are who you say you are. So somebody who looked even remotely similar to you could bypass one of these biometrics. Um, early facial recognition couldn't tell whether it was a 3D image or a 2D image. You could actually hold up a picture and bypass it. Not so today. They're actually looking for some form of movement to make sure that it is a three-dimensional object that they're scanning. And um, they've added simple things like you would have to look at the camera. So you could hold up the camera to somebody who was sleeping and get into their phones or something like that. So little things like that that they use to kind of, you know, beef up the security a little bit. And they're getting a bit better. So instead of using like five or six points of reference, they're using like 15, which is exponentially better. It's not perfect, but many people, you know, had instances where their, their own kids were getting into their phones because they looked similar enough where the phone would say, okay, yeah, that's the person because they're only using four or five points of reference. Um, Another more intrusive kind would be a, um, a retinal scan versus an iris scan. Iris is the outside of your eye. Retinal is further back. It's the back of your eye. So that's like where you would have to literally hold your eye up and they would have that camera, the light scan your eye to get a picture of your retina and see if that passed. More secure, more intrusive. All right. Other physical examples of security, RFID badges, which is a radio frequency identification. Um, it's a wireless, no contact technology, almost like near field communication. And um, have you ever walked out of a store and accidentally set off the, uh, the alarm? I've done it at least a dozen times. Um, that's typically from an RFID badge. That's those little clips that are on the clothing. Sometimes they can be as small as like a little sticker. Like in bookstores, have you ever had that, that sticker fall out that looks like a little microchip? That's the RFID badge, the security badge, uh, things like that. And uh, they can be used for security. They can be used for inventory. Um, so you can use it as a means for you to be able to access a building, but you can also use it as a means to determine what things are in the building, and if somebody tries to remove those things. Uh, smart cards. Uh, this is a type of badge uh, that gives you access to resources itself. So instead of just a picture badge, uh, this would be a badge that would have um, a chip inserted, at you, inserted on it usually. Uh, the ones I always referred to are either the military ID badges with that little gold chip at the bottom or the CAC cards for the uh, ports. Now we're starting to see them show up on credit cards, that little chip, that gold chip on the bottom, um, holds a lot of information and you insert it into the reader and then you would enter into pin code to verify that you know who you are. And then at that point, you're either given access to a computer system, a room or what have you. So whatever resource you're trying to get access to, as long as you have the correct pin code and chip, you're good to go. They make slight dif uh, differentiation between the key fob and the um, RFID. Because um, I think the RFID or the, the key fobs, a lot of times we'll use magnets, like certain types of magnets. I can't remember the exact distinction, but there is a slight difference between that. All right, tokens. There are two types of tokens. There are physical and software tokens. This right here is an example of a physical token. This would be something you would carry with you and it, would, it generates a number that changes about every 30 seconds. 
And so you would enter in this passcode that shows up on your token in order to gain access to your um, resource, whatever it be. You know, some people have these set up for their bank accounts, so they don't have the same pin every single time. They utilize a token like this, and then whatever their code is has to match what it should be on the other end for that token and gain you access. Um, Google or Microsoft Authenticator. There's a bunch of different software ones that you can download on your phone. Um, I would do some research on them before you use them, but uh, not all tokens are acceptable to all companies. Some companies only allow certain types, but it is a, another type of security. It adds that extra layer. This is considered something you have. Remember we talked about biometrics, which is something you are. This is something you have and the, the code is constantly changing. Um, another one, kind of fairly simple, is the entry control roster. It's just like a list at a party. If you're not on the list, you don't get in. So you, you have guards, essentially. There is a list of people who are allowed access. If you're not on that list, you're not allowed to get past them. If you're going to have a guest, they need to be pre-approved and added to the list before the guest arrives. Otherwise, the guest will not be granted access. Because some facilities, if they have high levels of security, may require background checks before they'll even let you in the building, even if you are a guest. Uh, we talked about these yesterday with regards to shoulder surfing, utilizing privacy filters. So much like Twisted Pneumatics, you're straight on, you can see them clearly. If you go slightly off center, the screen goes black, you're not able to read the screen. So this helps prevent things like shoulder surfing, people reading over your shoulders, what have you, especially if you're dealing with uh, sensitive materials and stuff like that. Um, any of y'all heard of, you, I'm sure many of you have heard of Edward Snowden. He was notorious for quite literally like having a blanket over him while he worked, he was so paranoid. So like he would work underneath a blanket. And then when he was done, he would shut down and close it and then take the blanket off. When he worked at the NSA, that was how he worked because he refused to let anybody, you know, peek over his shoulder when he was working. So depending on how you want to do this, I mean, you know, you're probably a little weird if you're working at your desk with a blanket on, but, you know, to each his own, I guess. So privacy filters. Any questions on physical security? A lot of it's pretty straightforward, but again, we're creating layers. You know? A 10 foot fence around your building, somebody really wants to, they can scale that fence, right? But 90 something percent of people won't bother. You know, they're gonna go to the gate and try to come in through the main way. So what it's doing is it's minimizing the amount of people, you know, that would try to bypass it. And if you see somebody scaling the fence, the odds are they're probably up to no good. You know, it's not somebody going, oh, I lost my keys, you know. All right. Digital security examples. Uh, we'll be getting into some of these in a little more detail in further technical sessions, but we're kind of just giving us a good overview on many of these right now. Um, so we got our antivirus firewalls, disabling ports, multi-factor authentication, VPNs, uh, trusted and untrusted software sources, data loss prevention, all that kind of fun stuff. All right, antivirus, anti-malware. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. We need to be more specific when we start saying anti-malware as opposed to antivirus as a universal term because after yesterday we know viruses are very specific things, right? And there's other nasty stuff that's out there that we need to protect against. So that's where the anti-malware comes in. Um, so typically this would be installed upon a single system and be utilized to protect that system. And um, so most viruses have particular characteristics and they tend to fall under common families of viruses, which are what we went over yesterday, like the phage, the multipartite, paramorphic or polymorphic, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And so they leave certain kind of fingerprints. They, they use certain kinds of actions. So one of two ways we would fight against them. One is the definitions list, which gives us those signatures of each of these viruses. And that list should be updated very, very regularly. So anything new comes out, we can see what its signature is. But there's still unknown stuff out there. And we will use something that is called a heuristic algorithm in order to track and see what's going on. And that's just kind of a fancy way of saying behavior, heuristic. So it's, you know, if certain resources start spiking, we know there's a good likelihood that a virus might be behind it. So the antivirus can take action to see what is causing that, what is the root program trying to work on that, and start trying to shut that down. Any questions on antivirus, any malware? Hmm? All right, firewalls. So we talked about these. These essentially determine what traffic can or cannot pass through coming in or out of your networks. We do have hardware and we have software firewalls. So we have a software firewall on the host, a hardware firewall to protect our network. And um, there are a couple different types or flavors of firewall. We have our stateful firewall, which is paying attention to that state of conversation. It wants to make sure that any communication is initiated from inside the firewall or behind it, going out into the world, and somebody out of the world cannot initiate that conversation with us. So it's paying attention to that state of conversation. Once it is initiated, it believes that the information passing is consensual. Other than that, we have the packet filter, which is paying attention to all the packets that are coming through, making sure that that's information that's okay to pass, making sure it's using the correct ports, making sure who we're communicating with, with, communicating with is or is not okay with the use of the access control list or ACL. And then you have uh, the third kind, which is a proxy firewall, which is making like when I try to access Google. And uh, the way the firewall is set up is I'm not actually asking Google. I'm asking my proxy firewall to ask Google. So it is doing something on behalf of me, but it also has content filters in place. So certain types of sites I'm not able to see or access. So I might not be able to see gambling sites or go to the lottery or, or you know, go to... Um, watch movies or stream Spotify, you know, go to adult sites or what have you. The content is filtered through this proxy firewall. Questions so far? All right. User authentication and strong passwords. We have a section in a T session coming up either this afternoon or some or Monday where we're going to go completely over creating strong passwords. Um, generally, you're going to set up a group policy to set minimum standards for your password. Um, how frequently you can use a password. And many of you try to create a password and says no, that's too similar to the one you just had. Um, or this is the same password you used, you know, a couple months ago or something like that. So they'll pay attention to your password history so you can't reuse them. They want to say, okay, it has to be at least eight characters. It has to have uppercase and lowercase letters. It has to have a number. It has to have symbols. So these all would fall into your group policies with creating strong passwords. This is going to change from company to company. Some are more generic. Some are stricter. Um, like you'll notice the, the password you had to set up for Slack was probably a lot um, less complicated or strict than the one you had to set up for test out. Remember, test out had, you know, higher complexity requirements than say Slack did. So from company to company, this can change, but we'll have some tricks. We'll talk about the reasons why this is and, uh, various factors that come into play with regards to passwords. Next, we talk about multi-factor authentication. We have talked about this a few times. We've mentioned it a few times, but this is basically what it is. So it operates off of 
four things technically. There's a fifth one, but they don't really get into that with regards to A+. Plus. Um, so there is something you know, which would be like your username and password. That's something that you know in your mind. There's something you have, which could be like your phone. When you, when you try to log in, they, and they send a code to your phone. They know you have your phone, so that not only do you know your username and password, but they send that code, you know the code. Um, then you're just something you are, which is biometrics. That's your fingerprints, facial recognition, eye scan, DNA, what have you. <clears throat> and then the last one is some where you are. So you can set limitations on where people can access certain types of information. So you would use GPS based data. You could use what's called geofencing, where you can say you have to be inside this certain perimeter to be able to access this information. If somebody outside that perimeter is trying to, then no go. So these are the four things that have to go with regards to multi-factor authentication. Now, in order for it to be considered multi-factor, you have to use at least two of these things. You cannot use two of the same. So you can't say username and password and a pin code that you also remember. So that's two things that you know. So that doesn't count. It has to be two separate things. So it has to be something you know and something you have. So that would be your username and password and then they send the code to your phone. Or you would put in your username and password and then it would ask for your fingerprint on your phone. So that's something you have and something you are. So you have to meet two of these standards for it to be considered multi-factor. All right, questions so far. Do we have a little bit better understanding of what multi-factor is? We will talk about it again, but this is kind of introducing us to these concepts. All right. Next, VPNs. We've mentioned this quite a few times. Um, this creates an encrypted tunnel between you and the servers. Sometimes that can be direct with your employer. Some that can be with the server farm and then you can come out wherever you want. Typically within the uh, examples of a enterprise or large organization, they would have a VPN set up specifically for employees. They would have a device, a physical device that creates the VPNs for you on their network. And only certain people would be able to, create, uh, to get access to those VPNs. And what it does is it kind of makes internal resources view you as if you're physically there, even though you may be working remotely. Questions with regards to a VPN? Was that yes, you have a question, Stephen, or? No, no, you just asked if we understood uh, okay. the slide before. Got it, got it. Context. All right. Next, talk about DLP or data loss prevention solutions. This is systems that you put in place to prevent sensitive information from getting outside of the organization. All right. So these solutions allow you to specify exactly what actions each user, each user must take um, with respect to certain documents, to you know, certain files, things like that. There, it may be a case where no computer has a U, uh, USB connection on it. It may be that there's no disk drives, no printers in the building. There are places that are this secure. Essentially, you show up, you have a keyboard and mouse. That's the only thing that's allowed to be connected to your computer. And you're not allowed to print anything. You're not allowed to save anything to any other external device. And that's it. Everything is saved. And they don't even save it on your computer. They save it on a remote server that you don't have access to other than through your terminal. So depending on the 
level of security and the sensitivity of the data you're working with, these standards can be relatively mild to pretty extreme. Other cases where we've actually seen this being used in real life a lot in the last 10 years or so is when there is sensitive data, um, you can actually encode things in a printer. So when you print a document, the document will have embedded in it. So like if you looked at it under a microscope and you looked at the little dots or whatever, it will have embedded in it code that will tell you what printer it was printed out on and who sent that job to the printer. So they can, you know, so if there's a leaked document and they get their hands on the document, they can say, okay, this was printed on the Brooklyn printer and DW sent it to the printer. And then you can, you can actually know what time it was printed. You can go back and verify this information. So these are other security method, methods that they will use, but that is more of a reactive measure after data loss has occurred. DLP is more paying attention to information so that it does not get lost. Questions? So DLP, data loss prevention. All right, disabling ports. This is one of the most basic principles of security. So I think we mentioned it before, if I'm gonna put up a web server, I may do what's called hardening that device, which is making it more secure. And I may shut off every port on that device with the exception of 80 and 443 so that it can be accessed via web for web server. That's if I have this device and it's only to be used for specific things, I can shut down everything else on it. So only those protocols can be accessed. And this is one of your most basic things because one of the first things many attackers do before they'll start at trying to access systems and do is do what is called a port scan. They wanna see what ports are open and available because you can ping specific ports on a device. And so they will check and see which ports are available. That way they know what methods of attack they may want to use next. Or did you leave some of the more vulnerable ones open? Also, you can disable ports with regards to USBs. We talked about that. So you can't plug in a USB. Um, Things like that, you can do that on switches and servers. Whatever ports on that switch is not supposed to have something plugged into it, you can have those ports disabled. And they actually, they have physical port locks you can put into where you, know, you can't actually physically put something in there. But again, it's another layer. Um, one of the easiest ways to bypass systems is to have UP, uh, USB devices with just some nasty software on it. <clears throat> People don't think about USBs much. <clears throat> and that's one of the key ways hackers would try to get past security um, because sometimes security will not disable auto run on USB devices. So you'll have some guy on the street saying, hey, man, I'm, you know, I'm an I'm a aspiring musician. I've created, you know, this really awesome album. I just hope you might take a listen to it, check it out, you know, see if you want to come to our show or whatever. So they're handing out little USBs with their music on it rather than CDs. You'll have companies like, hey, yeah, this is promotional material. Um, you know, here's here's a free USB drive for you. It's got some of our stuff on it. But whenever you're done, you can erase it and then use the USB for yourself. Think of it as a gift from us. Um, meanwhile, there is nefarious software on there and you plug it in it infects your system and you thought you got the better part of the deal because you got a free USB drive. Um, don't ever pick one up off the floor and plug it in just to see what's on. Case study on this was um, in Iran, how they were able to gain access 
to the centrifuges in Iran was they literally just dropped a few USBs outside the doors of the office. Like they just walked by, dropped a couple USBs, people pick them up, they're curious, it infects the systems. It tries to work that system, through that system until it got to where it needed to go. And they were able to infect the, um, the centrifuges in Iran. And what it did was it spun them up past safe levels, but allowed the output to show that everything was fine. And they were actually able to take out over 20% of Iran centrifuges with just USB sticks, dropping them outside the offices. And that was one of the more highly secured facilities in the country. So again, social engineering, people are curious, people like free stuff. So this is one of those things where you have to educate end users. If you find a USB on the floor, don't plug it in. If, you, uh, if somebody gives you one, even if it's for a promotional material, don't plug it in. Unless you get it you know, from a trusted source, like a, like a store or something like that, and the package is still intact. All right, access control lists. Sets of rules used on firewalls to control what traffic is allowed to enter or not. There are lists, um, the, you know, they'll either have a blacklist where they'll say, these are the companies that are not allowed. Anything not listed here is acceptable. They'll have whitelists where these are the companies that are allowed. Anything else is not accepted. Depending on the organization, we'll determine which they tend to prefer. It's easier to create, you know, it's easier to maintain a deny list than it is an allow list. So think of it in those terms. So it depends on how you're set up. Questions with regards to ACOs. All right. Here's one we all know and love, email filtering. How many remember the, the horrible days before spam filters were invented? When you got tens of thousands of emails a day, you couldn't delete them all because mom may have emailed you. You know, or, your, or a prospective employer may have emailed you. Now we utilize these spam filters. They help, you know, if it's something is known to have malicious software on it, it'll go ahead and delete it. Um, if they're sending out to, you know, the email lists on it or X, you know, X amount of people on it, they'll send it to spam. If it's coming from a known place that may be spam, it filters that off. And they're pretty good, but they're not perfect. And depending on how severe you want, I mean, you could literally have it so severe that it will only accept email from people who are in your contacts list. Everybody else is denied which kind of works, um, but you, you uh, tend to push a lot of valid mail to spam, like coming from your doctor's office, coming from, you know, new contacts that, you know, people trying to reach out to you, stuff like that, you miss out a lot of that. So you actually have to find that balance of security, like how intense do you want your spam filters to be? You know, even here, when you guys were getting your Coursera stuff, we're like, all right, check your spam filters. And then it's like, oh, there it is. So legitimate emails do get caught up in it. All right. Trusted or untrusted software sources. So you can set up policies that say, hey, we accept software from these types of locations, these specific providers. We do not accept it from anywhere else. Uh, depending on the type of company you're at, will determine how strict this is. Some may say as long as it comes from the, uh, the you know, the Windows shop, the Google Play Store or I, you know, iTunes Store or whatever, we're okay with it. It's fine. Uh, some may say we only accept it from these three companies. Everything else is denied. You know, so you may accept it from... Microsoft, but you're not going to accept a program to be downloaded from, you know, Bob's independent movie, you know, facility or something like that. 
And you can establish this in your group policy, how strict or you know, loose you want these rules to be. Questions on this? How many people didn't think there was this much that went into security? All right. I'm in that boat too. When I first started, I was like, wow, there's a lot. This is just for IT? Why do I have to worry about if they have guards? Unfortunately, it does fall under our purview. All right. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about user education. Let's see here. Bernard, can you read for us just user education? User education. Education is the most effective method of preventing viruses, spyware, and harmful and harm to data. Teach your user not to open a specific uh specific sp <laughs> sp suspicious there suspicious. There suspicious. There I can't say that word for them right now. Suspicious. Tongue twister, man. It happens. <laughs> to open only those files that uh, they responsible uh reasonably sure are aren't virus free they need to scan every disk email and document they receive before open they open them you should also have the workstation scheduled to be automatically scanned on a regular basis excellent so we're teaching them you know, hey, when you receive emails, look at the look at the name or look at the actual email address you receive. Not not what they say it's from, but look at the actual email address. Oftentimes, it's misspelled. It's it's different. They're using different domains. They look similar, but they're different than the company, and it's going to be easy to miss typos. So you look at the actual email address. You're going to scan those documents with virus scanners just to make sure they're okay. You may check the hash on them to make sure uh, what they sent is what you received. And let me see if I can find that quick picture real quick. So I can show you guys what a hash looks like. Let me stop this. So you can download a document here and then they'll send you this thing right here which is like says SHA-256 which tells me what kind of hashing algorithm they used and they'll call it a checksum and it'll give me a symbol like this or this series of letters and numbers it's it's uh, hexadecimal and I will run this same checksum on the the file or whatever I downloaded and if I get this exact same number using the algorithm they gave me then I know what they sent me it has not been tampered with. Because remember, any minor change in either the document or the word makes a huge change in this. So I compare it, it looks the same. I know what they sent me is what, I, what I'm supposed to receive. I can download the document. If they send it to me, they send me this sum here and then mine looks different than this, I do not open or activate that file because something has happened to it. It has changed. Interestingly, from a forensics perspective, if they're gonna do any work on a hard drive to look in and do, you know, see if anything bad had happened on that hard drive, they'll create what are called forensic copies and they'll do, they'll do these hashing checksums on every single hard drive they'll never operate on the main one and then they'll operate on all the others and see if they can find information but they use utilize these hashing algorithms for a lot of stuff all right Here we go. Uh, Melody, can you please read to us about the acceptable use policy? While education is important, in most cases, you must attempt to control what users do. 
The acceptable use policy AUP is a document that specifies what users can and cannot do, and it should be signed by all during the hiring process. It creates a contract that can be used later to form the basis for disciplinary measures. These measures and consequences are non-compliance should be spelled out ahead of time. Excellent, thank you. So, you know, if you do X, Y is gonna happen, you know? And it may be a sliding scale. Like it may be like, if it's something like you were trying to listen to Spotify, it may be written warning uh, or verbal written termination. Uh, if you tried to send sensitive documents to yourself via email, instant termination. All this would be spelled out in the acceptable use policy. And like I was telling you guys yesterday, the company I work for, you had to sign the AUP and agree to it every day. So every day we logged in, we had to sign and agree this. So there was never a case where you could say, nope, never saw it. So, all right. Client responsibility in preventative security. So you're gonna have, again, back on passwords, we're gonna have a company policy, which can determine the age that we allow passwords. Again, this changes with every company. It could be every year, could be every six months. Typical standard password uh, time that they allow is probably about 90 days or three months. Um, so you're going to use a company established minimum character account. It could be eight, could be 10, could be 20. And never write your passwords down, please. So many people write down passwords and put them on sticky notes on their monitor. Had a funny instance where the, the one of the people who um, monitored the grants that fund generation came in to monitor one of our classes. And I'm giving the lecture on this and talking about passwords and stuff, not this one, but another T session. And I'm talking about, you know, passwords being on post-it notes. And she's telling me after the fact that she's like staring at the bottom of her monitor where all of her passwords are written down. And uh, she's like, yeah, um, you guys did a great job. And, and I, I'm going to say, I actually, I learned a lot. <laughs> so, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. So you don't ever write them down. You don't share your password or your logon session with another person. So what do we mean by logon session? Where you have logged in and then you let them sit in your chair and drive. Don't share that with another person. You don't share your login with another person. We talked about that. IT should never ask for it. Your manager should never ask for it. These are not things that they should have access to. They have their own sign-in and passwords. You can walk them over and show them something at your desk, but they should not have your login and password. All right, logins. So you should never, ever walk away from a workstation that is logged on. Even if you're going to get a cup of coffee, you're walking to the printer, lock it. People can do a lot of nasty things in a very short period of time. We, you know, we actually reinforced this at the company I worked at, one of my first companies. If you left your computer unlocked, it was guaranteed somebody was gonna be playing a prank on you. They were gonna be changing your settings, they were going to be sending weird emails to people, you know, guaranteed some prank was going to happen if you walked away and your computer was left logged in. So, I mean, it was it was all fun and games, but it helped reinforce that culture of security. Um, another kind of fail safe is, you know, so you can have it to where it logs out after five minutes. But again, if you're getting up and walking away, you should be locking it. Um, password protected screensavers help. So even if the screensaver does come on, you can, you know, if somebody tries to, you know, jump out of the screensaver, then they still have to put in your login information. Don't use auto login features for this. And also, be cognizant of who's around you when you're logging in to try to prevent things like shoulder surfing, right? Okay, so typically other, other things you may wanna do, um, allow all approved, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stress that word approved. Good for you, buddy. 
um, all approved patches to be installed on your PC. So obviously that policy is gonna be different at home than it's gonna be at work. You know, because remember we need to test, test patches to make sure they're not gonna affect operating systems or uh, critical applications before we roll them out to the entire company. So make sure they're approved, but make sure you install any approved ones. Back up any personal data, personal files to verified removable media. So for enterprise settings, this may be back it up to the server. For personal use, it may be an external hard drive where you keep a copy of everything you have. How many people have started to put a backup policy in place for your personal stuff since you started here? Started looking at possibly get another hard drive so they can you know, keep track of all their stuff so they don't lose everything. How many people are still YOLOing it going like, yeah, it's never going to happen to me. I tried to for my files, but I didn't have enough space. Okay. Sometimes we got to, we got to, you know, get bigger hard drives, unfortunately. Mine's starting to get scary. I'm up to like a 16 terabyte drive. So um, I'm probably going to have to break down and get a, uh, a RAID system after this. <laughs> because they don't really make bigger drives than that. So. All right. Next. Uh, ta -ta -da. Never leave a company notebook or phone where it can be stolen or compromised. Remember how I was just talking a few minutes ago about if you walked away with your computer logged in, um, there was a prank that was going to happen. We would go to managers meetings. If you left your phone unattended, goodness help you. They would like send messages to your staff saying, great work, guys. You know, feel free to take the rest of the day off. You know, I mean, they would do all kinds of stuff to wreak havoc because it was, again, trying to reinforce um, this security mindset. You don't leave things unattended. You don't leave things logged in. All right. I believe this is the last one. Principle of least privilege. So when we're creating our group policies and assigning permissions to users, we only grant them the bare minimum permissions they need to do their job and no more. So they should have the minimum level of access that they need to accomplish their day-to-day -day tasks. This is also especially true with administrators. If you are an administrative level user, you should have two accounts. You should have a standard account and an administrative level account. And you should only ever log into your administrator account specifically when you need that access because you're minimizing the amount of time that that account is active and vulnerable to attack. If you use the administrative account all the time, then it's vulnerable to attack much more of that time and if somebody does get access to it they now have administrative level access so you have two accounts like we said on your on your home computer you should have your administrator account and then you create another user account for yourself and you use your account the majority of the time and only log into that administrator when you need to so same on personal computers <clears throat> Also, if you're one of those administrative level users, which hopefully we all are in short order, right? You know, we, you know, should also get extra education from our IT department and our company as to how each of these accounts should be used. When is it acceptable to log into my administrative account? All other times I should be using my user account. Questions, comments, concerns. All right. 
with that, we should be able to identify a variety of prevention methods. We're not just talking about all the doom and gloom from yesterday. We're actually talking about ways to stop it. What are some things that we can do to minimize these attacks? We talked about physical and digital security. You know, many of us probably weren't aware that we had to pay attention to the physical security of our systems as well as protecting them digitally. I was one of those people. I was not aware of this when I first started. I always thought that that was like, you know, security department or, you know, administrative level. They paid attention to the security of the building. I handled the systems. No, we're actually involved in that part of it too. Um, we should be able to talk about several ways clients can prevent security threats on their own. That's the acceptable use policies, data loss prevention, uh, principle of least privilege, things like that. Questions, comments, concerns?